Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we probably may have more trickle in, but I think in the interest of time, we'll get started. Um, so um, this is the spring 2023 offering of the Van CTR um, Machine Learning for Health Seminar Series. Um, we have three speak uh, three presentations this semester, similar to last fall. Um, today um, is our first one kicking off the spring series, and then there's another one in March, as well as one in April. Um, so we're pleased. I'm pleased to um, welcome our three presenters or introduce our three presenters um, for today who will be talking about validating a predictive model. I'll introduce um, Dr. Schmidt and then he will introduce other speakers and then they'll go into their presentation. So Dr. Schmidt is a professor and former chair of biostatistics at the Brown University School of Public Health, where he co-founded the Center for Evidence Synthesis and Health. Um, he also directs the BIRD Corps for Advanced CTR, so that's the Biostatistics, Epidemiology, and Research Design Corps. Um, um, his research focuses on Bayesian methods for meta-analysis. Um, he works on analysis of data from NF1 trials and also work with development and assessment of predictive models, which um, we'll be hearing about today. Um, and he has a number of accomplishments and honors um, in the field of biostatistics. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Chris, to introduce other speakers and get us started. Okay, thanks, Liz. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so I have two um, co-speakers with me who've been working with me on this project um, for, actually, I've worked with Adam Levine, who's a physician at, at um, Rhode Island Hospital and a, a well-known global health expert who has been working for years on developing um, a predictive model for uh, diagnosing dehydration in, in Bangladesh. And I've worked with Adam for, I don't know, seven or eight years now. And um, we originally developed a model for children and we've recently uh, are completing a, a project where we're developing a model for um, diagnosing this in older children and adults. And um, so Adam will be uh, helping me out with the presentation and giving an overview of the, of the project. And there are other, um, Co-investigator here is Kishin Shu, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Biostatistics at Brown. And she's been working with me and Adam for several years on this project um, and has done most of the, of the coding for this and has produced most of the data and results that you'll see. Um, and so um, she will be helping us out with the presentation today. Um, so we're really happy to have um, both Adam and Kishin with me in, in making this presentation. And so I'm going to um, going to run the slides here. So I'm going to uh, tell you that we're going to try to introduce you to the idea of how you validate a predictive model using this predictive model that we've been developing um, with Adam's project in Bangladesh. And uh, as of now, I'm going to turn this over to Adam to give you an introduction to the project. Okay. Thank you so much, Chris. And it has been a real pleasure working with you and your team on this for so many years now. Um, so for those of you who don't have as much of a global health background, you may not realize the importance of acute diarrhea um, as a burden of disease around the world. But in fact, uh, diarrhea is the second most common disease in the world, um, affecting uh, over 6 billion people every single year and uh, actually the second leading cause of death in children under five, uh, leading to 400,000 deaths every year in young children. Um, it also though is a leading cause of death in older children and adults. Uh, overall, it's the eighth leading cause of death in the world. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, ranking below some of the more well-known diseases like heart disease, stroke, um, lower respiratory infections or pneumonia, and uh, Alzheimer's disease. But if we look at low-income low countries specifically, where the poorest people in the world live, you can go to the next slide, it's actually the fifth leading cause of uh, death uh, in low-income countries um, across the world. And so this is a really important burden of disease, especially in the global south, and one for which uh, there has been some significant progress over the past few decades. Uh, new treatment modalities, such as oral rehydration solution, which was invented largely in the 1970s and 80s, um, have led to dramatic declines in diarrheal death rates, especially in young children. Um, it's suggested that up to 50 million lives have been saved by oral rehydration solution. 
And overall, we've seen you know, significant declines, especially in the number of children dying each year from diarrhea, but it still remains a leading uh, cause of morbidity and mortality. Uh, next slide. So you can see by the box here, our study takes place in Bangladesh. And you know this map just shows clearly how much mortality from diarrhea varies across the world. And there's much more variability when it comes to diarrhea mortality than there is with regards to diarrhea incidence. Uh, diarrhea is of course common all over the world. There's no one in this webinar who hasn't had diarrhea at some point. And on average, every uh, adult and child in the world will experience about one episode of diarrhea each year. Um, however, that diarrhea only rarely results in death. Um, but if you happen to live in sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, it's far more likely to result in death uh, than if you live in the Americas or in Europe uh, or Australia. And part of the reason for that is the types of bacteria or the types of organisms that cause diarrhea in these places tend to be more severe. And in particular, cholera is a bacteria that is known to cause the most severe form of diarrhea. Um, it can rapidly lead to dehydration and death in patients. And in 2022, the World Health Organization warned of a sharp uptick in the number of cholera outbreaks around the world, uh, largely due to conflict, displacement, and climate change. Um, and so this is an increasing problem, especially in low and middle income countries. Um, the other reason for the increased mortality is lack of access to diagnostics and treatment uh, for diarrhea. And really the most important treatment for diarrhea is rehydration. Almost everyone who dies of diarrhea dies from dehydration. And so getting uh, appropriate rehydration can be life-saving and can help even out this inequality and mortality between rich and poor countries. Uh, next slide. So the World Health Organization um, has uh, a specific algorithm for managing uh, diarrhea, and it breaks cases of diarrhea into three different categories with three different management plans. The first management plan, plan A, is just expectant management. This is for patients with uh, very mild disease who have no dehydration. And those patients actually don't need any specific treatment. And this is the vast majority of patients with diarrhea they need to continue uh, eating and drink plenty of extra fluids. Um, so sometimes cultural um, prescriptions suggest that patients shouldn't eat or drink if they have diarrhea. And so uh, you want to combat that by telling patients to keep eating and drinking and then provide instructions to the patient or the parent uh, to return for anything that gets worse. For patients who have some dehydration or moderate dehydration, the recommendation is oral rehydration with a special solution of salt and sugar, uh, which actually allows the gut to better take up water than if patients just drink water by itself. And this again is the treatment I had mentioned that has been credited with saving so many lives around the world. And then finally, for those patients with severe dehydration, they need rapid intravenous rehydration in a hospital setting uh, in order to prevent organ ischemia and death. And of course, this is the most costly and burdensome treatment plan, but only is necessary for a small percentage of those patients with acute diarrhea. Most could be managed by plan A or plan B, if only we had a good way of dividing patients up between these three different plans. Next slide. So the WHO has an algorithm uh, that they developed back in the 1980s, uh, which recommends using these four clinical signs to divide patients up into these three categories, severe dehydration, some dehydration, or no dehydration, with patients with no dehydration getting plan A, some dehydration getting plan B, and severe dehydration getting plan C. But this algorithm was essentially developed based on expert opinion by a group of experts sitting together in a room in Geneva. They had absolutely no empirical data. Uh, when they developed this algorithm, and they had never even attempted to validate it, um, either in children who the uh, algorithm was originally developed for, or later when they extended its use to older children and adults, uh, they never attempted to validate it in that new population. And as you can imagine, there's a big difference between how you would examine a 58-year-old with diarrhea and a five-month-old with diarrhea. Uh, next slide. I don't know why it's not advancing here. I just have to click on the uh, 
No, what's the problem? Okay, there you go. Let me try to go back here. All right, is that where we were? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, all right. <clears throat> so um, as Chris had mentioned uh, <clears throat> earlier, we had developed and validated a new clinical prediction model for diagnosing dehydration in children under five years of age, which was definitely the highest priority population. And we were able to show in a publication in the Lancet Global Health that it was uh, more accurate and reliable than the WHO algorithm. Um, but afterwards, we wanted to go on to develop a separate algorithm for use in patients over five years of age. Um, and we uh, received an R01 from the NIH and uh, through that, the Nerudak study, uh, which actually means dehydrated in Bangla, in Bangladesh, in addition to having this cool acronym, uh, was born. And so we started that five years ago in Bangladesh. Uh, next slide. So the objective of this study was to first uh, derive a new clinical prediction model um, using empirically collected data in patients over five years of age with acute diarrhea. Uh, presenting to the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, Dhaka Hospital in Bangladesh. Uh, then we wanted to develop a mobile health tool that incorporated this new model that we were developing. And then finally, we wanted to validate the accuracy, reliability, and usability uh, in a new population of patients. Uh, next slide. And next slide. So the study setting for our uh, derivation phase uh, was this ICDDRB Dhaka Hospital, which is a research hospital based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. It's world renowned as a center for study of um, infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases in low income countries. And we uh, basically enrolled 24 hours a day, seven days a week, randomly selecting patients over five years of age who presented with acute diarrhea. And we excluded patients who had chronic diarrhea, who did not meet the WHO definition of diarrhea, which is three loose stools per day, or who had a clear alternative diagnosis to gastroenteritis or had been previously enrolled in our NRUDEC study. Next slide. Um, on arrival, we had uh, research nurses who we trained, and they collected all of the data for our study. So they collected all of uh, the clinical signs, and we had a long, long laundry list of clinical signs and symptoms of dehydration uh, that we collected at the beginning in order to try and identify the best combination of signs and symptoms for assessing dehydration. And so this is a list of some of the uh, signs and symptoms that we collected on every patient on arrival. Next slide. Oops, got stuck again. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And um, of course, when you're doing the diagnostic, uh, when you're driving a clinical prediction model, you need a outcome against which to derive it. And so our outcome was the percent dehydration, which de was defined as the post-illness weight minus the admission weight divided by the post-illness weight times 100. And these categories are pretty arbitrary, but they're the categories that WHO defines for severe dehydration, some dehydration, and no dehydration. And so since we we're trying to develop a prediction model that could help uh, feed into and provide guidance on which of the WHO management strategies to use, plan A, B, or C, we utilize the WHO cutoffs for no dehydration, some dehydration, and severe dehydration. Uh, next. Um, so I think this is where I turn it over to you, Chris. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Um, so we're basically going to take you first through the how we develop the models, and then we're going to talk about how we actually evaluate how well the models are doing. And so um, as, as Adam mentioned, we collected data in a derivation phase over the course of a year. Um, and we used the data that we had collected in those data um, collection forms to develop a model. Um, we developed several different models um, for the purposes of just explanation here. I'm gonna concentrate on what we call the, the full Nerudak model, which included age, sex, and 16 clinical predictors. And we used a, um, a forward stepwise regression technique using cross-validation um, to develop our final model. And, and all of this is um, described in our, in our paper. Um, and, and since the purpose here is really to talk about validating a model, uh, I'm not gonna get into the details um, of that. Maybe we, could, maybe we could do that on another 
um, talk sometime, another webinar. But basically what we did was we developed an algorithm using cross-validation in order to not um, to, to select variables, but without overfitting uh, the data to, to the, the model to our data. Um, and looking at models both with and without interactions, we um, we use the cross validation to select um, the best model size, which you could think of as the number of variables in the model. Um, we chose the the size that had the lowest average uh, test log likelihood across the cross validation. We use 10 tenfold cross validation. And then we developed the final model by applying the forward stepwise regression to the whole data set. So again, um, if you're familiar with these kinds of techniques, you'll know what I'm saying. If you're not, it, it's not that big a deal. Um, just know that we used a very uh, carefully selected algorithm to develop our original model that we're gonna use to um, explain the validation techniques. So as Adam mentioned, uh, we have a three level outcome of severe, moderate, and no dehydration. And so we needed to use some kind of a regression model that would be appropriate for such an ordered categorical outcome. We decided to use the cumulative logit model, which is probably the most common type of model. <clears throat> and basically, one way of thinking about a cumulative logit model is, <clears throat> for those of you who are familiar with, with binary logistic regression, this is just a combination of two different uh, binary models. So one is comparing whether or not you have severe disease with whether you don't have severe disease, which would be a combination of either uh, moderate disease or no disease, uh, sorry, dehydration. Um, and the other is combining severe and moderate into a category I'll call any dehydration versus none. Um, and so one way to think about that is you could, you could fit separate logistic regressions to those two different outcomes. Um, and what the cumulative logit model does is it fits those two models simultaneously uh, with one likelihood. And there are two different forms of this model. One is called a proportional odds model. And that assumes that basically that the, the, um, the slopes of those two models are the same, but that the intercepts might vary. Uh, the second one is a non-proportional odds model, which allows both the slopes and the intercepts to vary. And I'm gonna actually be talking about a proportional odds model today that we, that we developed. So the full model um, has eight clinical predictors um, in it. Um, it has uh, whether or not your, your skin, uh, when you pinch the skin, does it return to, um, to normal uh, very quickly or very slowly? Um, the sort of level of um, your eyes, in other words, are your eyes very sunken or, or not? Um, your respiration depth, uh, the number of episodes of vomiting you've reported uh, before coming to the, to the clinic. Uh, sex, age, the mid-upper arm uh, circumference, which is a measure of dehydration, and then your blood pressure. And um, I've given the, the link down below to our, to our paper that we published in 2021, which described the validation of this model. Um, so now moving on toward model performance, once you've developed a model like this, um, you want to know how well it does. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways that we um, we look at model performance. If you have a continuous outcome, a, a common metric is the percent variation explained or commonly called the R squared. And another uh, form would be the mean squared error, which is the, uh, the average squared distance between the observed and the predicted. If you have a discrete outcome like we do, we often talk about discrimination and calibration. And that, since that's our what our focus is on this um, particular model, that's what I'm gonna focus on today is telling you what what discrimination and calibration is and, and how we evaluate it uh, in these models. So the idea of discrimination is that you want to correctly distinguish between the outcome classes um, so that the predicted values are highest uh, for the outcome category that occurs. So to give you an example, let's say you have an individual who is severely dehydrated um, and, and your model gives you a prediction of that they had severe, moderate, or no dehydration, you would like the individual who has the severe dehydration to have the highest predicted probability associated with severe dehydration. Um, and so what we do is we calculate a concordance or C statistic, um, which looks at every pair of individuals who has a different outcome 
and make sure that the, the individual has the predicted outcome highest for the outcome that they actually have. So for example, if I took an individual who was one individual who was severely dehydrated and another individual who was moderately dehydrated, I would want to make sure that the individual with severe de dehydration um, had the higher predicted probability of severe dehydration and the person with the moderate dehydration had the higher predicted probability of the moderate dehydration. Um, and so in a binary case, this is usually done by um, displaying a receiver operating characteristic or ROC curve and calculating the area under that curve. And I'll, I'm gonna give you an example of, of how we do that. But basically um, the area under the curve uh, corresponds to the probability that the right prediction is associated with the right outcome. Um, so the um, ROC curve is formed by plotting the sensitivity and specificity that you would get for this uh, decision, um, choosing a different threshold of probability. So the sensitivity is the probability that the predicted risk is above the threshold among the people who have the outcome. And the sense of specificity is probably that the predicted risk is below the threshold among the people without the outcome. So if you think about a binary case of let's say severe dehydration, in, in one category and non-severe in the other, um, you want to make sure that if you look at somebody with severe dehydration and somebody without, and you, for example, pick a threshold that the um, individuals um, who have predicted probabilities above the threshold are more likely to have severe disease and those below it are less likely to have that. Um, so I've got a picture here of, of an ROC curve that we developed from our model. And, and so this plots the sensitivity versus the specificity so if I pick a point on that curve, that corresponds to a certain threshold. So for example, I might say everybody who has a predicted probability above 50% um, is predicted to have the outcome, and everybody below 50% is predicted to not have the outcome. And from that, I can then calculate the sensitivity and the specificity of that threshold, and that gives me a point on this curve. And as I vary that threshold of predicted probability from zero to, to 100%, um, I trace out this curve. And the area under this curve is the probability that I make basically a correct prediction. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, there's a trade-off here um, going from the, um, the lower left to the upper right. Um, if, if I pick a threshold, um, on the lower left, that means that I have a sensitivity of zero and a specificity of one. Um, so that would correspond um, to basically saying that I have a very strict criterion and um, it, it's very unlikely that I'm going to pick out those people um, who have uh, dehydration. And so for example, if I pick a very um, high threshold like 99% and say that I'm only going to say somebody's dehydrated if their probability is greater than 99%, then I'm going to be very unlikely to identify anybody in that group as being dehydrated. So I'll have very low sensitivity and I'll be at the lower end of this curve. If on the other hand, I predicted somebody to have dehydration if they had higher than a 1% probability, then I would pick up almost everybody who has dehydration. I'd be at the upper end of this curve, but I would have very low specificity because I'd miss uh, I'd be basically calling everybody dehydrated when, when only some of them were. So that's basically the trade-off um, on the ROC curve. So when we have more than two outcome categories, um, as I said, we can think of that as two different logistic regressions. And so in some sense, we have two different ROC curves. Um, and so the discrimination is a little bit harder to visualize and to assess because we have these, these multiple categories. Um, so... For an ordinal model, each model, the model will predict a probability of severe dehydration, moderate dehydration, or no, de no dehydration for each person. And so we can have several extensions of this C index that are available. Um, I'm gonna talk about one particular one, which is I think the simplest to understand, which is called the average dichotomized C, C index, which I'll abbreviate as ADC. And this is basically an average of the C indexes or areas under the curve formed by each of the binary indices 
from the cumulative load jet model. So the first one compares the model of severe versus not severe, and the second one is the model for any versus none. Uh, so we have we, each of those forms an ROC curve, each of those gives us an area under the curve in a C index, and then we just basically average those two areas to get the ADC. So that's discrimination. And I'll show you some examples of that later with our um, with our modeling. The, the, other, um, the other type of um, predictive performance that we're interested in is calibration. So whereas discrimination allows you to discriminate those who have um, sort of a higher probability from a lower probability, calibration is basically looking at how similar are the predictions and how accurate are they on a given individual. Um, so for example, if, if a certain number percentage of people have a disease, you'd like the average of the probabilities of all those people to be that percentage. Um, so uh, just as an example of how you could have good discrimination but not good calibration, I might have a model where everybody who has the outcome is predicted to have a 51% probability of having the outcome. And everyone who doesn't have the outcome has a 49% predicted probability. That will perfectly discriminate those who have um, the outcome from those who don't because 51 is always higher than 49. But it doesn't really give me a good idea of how likely they are to have the, the outcome because they're both predicted to be about 50%. So if, if somebody has a 10% probability of, of having the outcome, we'd really like 10% of those people to have the outcome. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to group individuals by deciles um, of predicted probabilities. So I take the individuals with the 10% lowest predicted probabilities. I cal calculate their average. I compare it to the observed event rate in that group. And then I hope that those will match up. So um, for example, in this plot I'm showing you here, I've got 10 deciles. If I look at the lowest one, um, you can see that the average there is about 0.01, which is about 1%. Um, and that's pretty close. The observed and predicted match up pretty close to that solid line, which is the line of equality. Um, if I go to the um, the highest um, uh, decile, which is on the on the on the far right, you can see there that the average prediction is a little bit less than the average observed. In other words, we're we're sort of sorry. The average prediction is higher than the average observed. We're um, we're under predicting there. And so um, we would like these to line up along the line of equality, but they don't always do that. And so one way of calibrating is to plot these and, and plot a smooth curve and just see how it looks. Another way you could do it is you could actually calculate a chi-score statistic to compare the observed and expected here um, and do a chi-score test. And that's called the hosmer lemma show test. Now, another way you could think about this um, is by two different ways of kind of summarizing across these uh, different possible ways of breaking up the data. Um, so one is called calibration in the large, and that basically just <clears throat> simplifies to, does the average observed match up with the average predicted? And I'm gonna show you that in our derivation data, this holds, whereas in the validation data, it doesn't um, for, for a particular reason. So if, for example, 30% um, of people in my data set have the outcome, but my model predicts on average that only 20% have the outcome, then my model is not well calibrated in the large. And so differences would indicate that the model predictions are on average either too high or too low. Um, now, generally, when you develop a model on a data set, um, you're, you're making sure that that model matches the data very well. Um, that's what the whole model selection process does. And so generally models will be pretty well calibrated on the data set from which they're developed. Uh, in fact, if you use standard techniques like maximum likelihood, they, they're, they're guaranteed to be um, right on average. But on another data set that you might collect, like we did, um, they could differ. There's another way of thinking about calibration, which is to basically say, how well do the observed and predicted match up? And so David Cox suggested a long time ago um, to basically take the observed and the predicted 
and to fit a regression, let's say a logistic regression of the observed probabilities on the predicted probabilities, um, where the observed is either a binary outcome of zero or one, and the predicted is a number between zero and 100, and just to basically see how well those match up. If they, if you, um, if they fit this line of equality, then they should have a slope of one and an intercept of zero in that logistic regression. So notice that if I if I fix the slope at one and, and fit the model, uh, then I'm basically just fitting a mean, and then the intercept will will estimate the mean difference. And so in that case, I'm actually estimating the calibration in the large. But if I don't fix the slope at one, if I allow my model to estimate both the slope and the intercept, then I could find deviations. And so in particular, if I have a model where the slope is less than one, then that model will overpredict at the high end and potentially underpredict at the low end. Um, and so that model would be not properly calibrated. Um, if, the, if the slope is greater than one, um, in, indicated here by the, um, the uh, solid line being above the dotted line, then I would be overpredicting at one end and underpredicting at the other. Um, if the slope equals one, but the intercept is not zero, then the model is systematically overpredicting everywhere. Um, if the slope is one, but the intercept is greater than zero, then I'm systematically underpredicting. Um, so basically, um, we can we can do this logistic regression of the observed on the predicted to see whether the model is well calibrated. And then if we have more than two outcome levels, we can extend this to cumulative logit models by calibrating each of the regressions separately. And in that case, we might find that some models are well calibrated and others are poorly calibrated. For example, we could be very well calibrated on predicting severe dehydration, but not as well calibrated on predicting any dehydration. All right, so those are the two main performance measures that we generally look at when we're when we're um, calibrating a, uh, a discrete outcome model. And um, so one is discrimination, one is calibration. Now let's talk a little bit about validation. So we've got a model um, and we, how do we know whether that model works? Well, the first is internal validation. And that says, how well does the model perform on the same data set as it was used to develop the algorithm? Um, and so generally, as I said, a model will perform pretty well on the model that you, on the data set that you developed it on, um, because you're, you're trying to fit the model to that data. We're all aware of the fact that we could overfit the model to the data by, by fitting it to particular um, characteristics of the data that, that might be idiosyncratic, that don't generalize. Um, and so what we, we typically will do is we will, um, to, to get around that, we might split the data set into two pieces and, and train or develop the model on one piece and then test it on the other, just to make sure that the model you know, does a good job um, on some sort of data that it wasn't actually developed on. Another way of doing this is by using cross-validation, which I'll explain um, on the next slide. The other way of validating a model is external validation. And this says, take, uh, take data from a completely different data set that you've collected and see whether the model you developed on the first data set actually fits the second data set well. And so that's what we've been doing in, in the NERUDAC study that we'll show you some preliminary results on that are actually not published yet. Um, so just expanding on this external validation, um, you know, if we if you select a different data set, that different data set could come from a lot of different sources. You could collect it in the same location at a different time, which is what we did in our study. We collected the derivation data one year, and then a couple of years later, we collected the validation data, but we collected it at the same clinic in, in DACA. Um, you could also collect the data at the same time, but in a different location. So for example, we could have collected our derivation data in DACA, and we could have collected our validation data, let's say somewhere else, like in Africa, and then say, develop the model in, in Bangladesh and test it in Africa. Or we could, or we, our validation data could be collected at a different time and in a different location. Now, each of these has advantages and disadvantages. Um, obviously, you'd like to generalize your answer to a different population, 
And presumably also you'd like to know whether there's any trends over time. Um, different locations and different times may um, lead you to different sort of processes that are that are operating. So for example, different nurses collecting the data, uh, different, different ways that um, patients might be seen uh, at the clinic and so forth. Um, and, and this may relate to di different types of reliability you have in, in the individuals collecting the data. Um, in general, there's a, there's a whole issue of transportability, which is how well does one model transport from one setting to another? Uh, and that's kind of a whole another um, uh, research area that, that um, some of us are working on and that maybe we can talk about uh, at, a diff at a later webinar. So this training and testing, uh, we have a data set. We might split it up into a training uh, piece and a test piece. Um, we might also set the uh, think about the training piece as being sort of the derivation data, and we might split that up into a training piece and, a, and an internal validation piece, and then have an external validation uh, validation, which is the setting. So different ways that, that you can do that. You could also take your original data set and split it into three parts, um, you know, uh, set aside one part for sort of internal testing and then set aside another part for internal validation um, in which you develop the model. So just very quickly, um, Jon Steingrimson gave a talk um, last semester on, on model building and um, he, he used this slide, so I just borrowed it from him um, in terms of how cross-validation works. Um, if you think about dividing your data into five pieces, you can set aside one piece, develop it on the other four pieces, and then test it on the fifth piece. And you can do that for each piece uh, sort of in, in sequentially, and then uh, you have basically five sort of internal test sets, and then you can average across those five sets to get your internal performance. And that's what we basically mean um, by cross-validation. Um, now, once you've developed the model, the other thing we would like to know is, well, how well does that model perform um, on, on a different data set? Now, uh, before we had the, the external validation, we wanted to test this on internal validation. And so we used the concept of bootstrapping uh, to correct for over-optimism, meaning um, correct for the the issue that when you develop a model on one data set, you might be fitting that data too well, uh, but it won't generalize very well to another data set because of overfitting. So we use Bootstrap uh, to do to uh, to to correct for that. So I have a, a sort of a graphic here that that Kishin developed um, that I'm going to try to take you through in steps to show you how the bootstrapping works. So we have our full data and. On the full data set, we might develop our model as we did, and we can then calculate a measure of performance, let's say the RSC area, and I'll call that the apparent performance of the model, um, C underscore APP, um, which is basically how well does the model seem to, to do, but again, bearing in mind that this is the performance of the model on the data set on which it was developed, so it's probably going to overestimate uh, true performance on another data set. So to get around that, we actually take the full data and we construct B different bootstrap data sets. And what a bootstrap data set is, you're randomly drawing um, a certain number of, number of observations from a full data set with replacement. So if my data set had a thousand uh, individuals in it, I would draw B 1000 person bootstraps, where since I'm sampling with replacement, the same individual could be in a bootstrap data set more than once. Um, and so you can think of the bootstrap data set as being some subset of the original full data. And then some of the individuals make the bootstrap and some don't. And so the ones who do are in the bootstrap data set and the ones who don't are out of the bootstrap data set or we'll call it theirs, they're out of bag. Now on these bootstrap, each of these bootstrap data sets, we're gonna develop a model from the bootstrap data. And um, we will then, um, use the same procedure that we did in developing the original model to develop the bootstrap models. And this is why these model algorithms often have to be automated uh, because you need to run them many, many times. And so you can't possibly sit there and you know analyze the data um, yourself um, for each one. You have to let a computer just do this automatically. 
Um, so we then take those B models that we've developed and we compute the performance of the model on both the in-bag and the out-of-bag bootstrap data and also back on the original data set. So we're going to compute the, the boot performance, the test performance, and the, and the performance on the original data set for each of these B models. And then we're going to basically <clears throat> average those um, across all the bootstraps. So the performance on the in bag, which is labeled C boot here, that sort of approximates the training performance, right? Because that's the bootstrap model applied to the, its own bootstrap data. And the, the, the out of bag performance is approximating test performance because we're taking the model that we developed on the bootstrap data and we're applying it to the out of bag data that, that the bootstrap model didn't see. We then average these across all the bootstrap samples, and then we compute the over-optimism by taking a weighted average of the apparent performance from the original model and the full data and this bootstrap-adjusted test performance. And there are various algorithms that I'm not going to get into here for, for how you do that weighting, um, but that basically gives you a, a better estimate of performance than, than the apparent. Um, and so there, as, a, as I say, there's various ways of doing that. Okay, so um, let me just now show you the results of, of what we've done. So in our derivation study, um, this is our flowchart that's that's published. Um, basically, we selected about 4,000 people randomly for screening. We ended up enrolling a little over 2,100 in the study, and those individuals were stratified on age so that we had roughly equal numbers of children, adults, and elderly, uh, elderly being defined as over 60 years. Um, and those individuals then were um, studied, and we see that uh, about 300 of them were severely dehydrated, 1,400 were moderately dehydrated, and 400 had no dehydration. We then developed our models, and so what I'm showing you here is the performance on the training data. Um, we had an area under the curve of 0.79, which is pretty good, um, and our calibration looks pretty good, as we'd expect or calibrating on the training data, you can see the predicted probabilities are, are pretty much um, all fairly small um, because it's unlikely here that um, any individual in particular would look severely dehydrated. Um, some of the probabilities approach 50%, but most of them are in the zero to 20% range. Uh, and then, as I said, with the cumulative logit model, you actually have two ROC curves. And so here are the two curves that we got. One is for severe versus not severe. One is for any versus none. And you can see they're both um, fairly similar. And so the, the average dichotomized C uh, summary statistic would just basically be an average of these two. Um, and as you can see on the training data, that comes out to be 0.79. And when we use our cross-validated bootstrapped um, measure, um, it reduces a little bit to 0.76. So the op over-optimism here is a little about, about 3%. So, so our model is still pretty good even when validated internally. <clears throat> All right, so the next thing I wanna show you is we're gonna now move to the validation phase. So we've, we've developed this model, it seems to do pretty well. Now we collect a new data set. Um, so this has got a sample size of about 1600. This was collected last year. We're still actually working on the paper, so this is this is new information. Um, and so I'm going to show you, you know, how the model actually did in a new data set. Does the performance still look good? So here's our flow chart for the validation study. Um, we ended up with about 1,600 people, and again, some were dehydrated and some were not dehydrated. Um, the prevalences are a little bit different, um, and um, here. Here are the levels comparing the derivation data and the validation data by dehydration level and by age. And um, these, are per, these are percentages, so these are not counts. Um, and just a couple things I want to note here to you. First of all, you can see that we have recorded outcomes on almost everybody. There's only 1% missing data, which is you know, just an incredible accomplishment and says a lot for the, for the study team and, and, and the data collection um, in Bangladesh. Um, Second of all, you'll note that in the derivation study, uh, the numbers of children, adults, and elderly are fairly equal, whereas in the validation data, we have many, many more adults. 
The reason for that is in the first study, we stratified on age as one of the ways of getting into the study because we were interested in potentially developing models for different ages, but we realized that the models were all fairly similar by age. And so in the validation data, we did not stratify on that and we just ended up with many more adults. And the third point to note is if you look at the severe dehydration levels, they are much less in the validation data than in the derivation data. Um, we don't fully know the reason for that, but it's probably due somewhat to the circumstances um, of the climate. Um, severe, severe dehydration tends to occur when there's cholera, and there was probably less cholera in 2022 than there, than there was in uh, 20, I think it was 2019 or 2020, I can't remember which exactly year, I think it was 2020 that we collected the data originally. Um, so just differences in, in the uh, numbers of people. And, and well, there also is probably something to do with, with the COVID pandemic and who actually got into the database. Um, we can also compare the clinical symptoms in the two data sets, and you can see that they're, they're somewhat different. Um, we haven't fully kind of analyzed this yet, but uh, just to show you um, that there is a difference here between the derivation and the validation data in terms of these distributions. And so that's actually good from the purposes of, of validating the study because it means that we have a different data set, sort of slightly different population, and we can see whether the model performs as well in this different population. So looking at the external validation, this is the severe versus not severe, the AUC area under the curve here is 0.74. If you remember in the derivation data, it was about 0.79. So um, actually we do have a little bit reduced performance as we would expect going to a new data set, but the performance is still pretty good. Um, we actually can look at different level, different thresholds on this curve to see uh, how it performs. So if we use a 12% threshold, meaning that everybody over a 12% predicted probability is considered to be severely diseased, to be conservative, we have 82% sensitivity, 49% specificity, uh, if we vary those thresholds, we can get sensitivity close to 90%, but then we drop the specificity to about 40%. Or we can, the specificity, if we look at a high specificity uh, threshold, we, we lose a little bit on the sensitivity. And the calibration, um, you'll note here that the model is not well calibrated. And the reason for that is, remember that in the validation data set, the number of severely dehydrated individuals is much lower than in the original data set. Um, so we're not predicting very accurately here. In fact, uh, what this is showing is when the predicted probabilities are, let's say 0.4 and 0.5, the observed rate is only 0.2. So um, in the deciles of very highly, uh, those individuals that we think are very, very likely to be severely hydrated, they're not as severely dehydrated as we'd expect. And so again, this is because we are, um, are over-predicting here. So this is a calibration that, that doesn't work quite as well. We could then recalibrate the model using that slope and intercept from that calibration formulation to recalibrate the probabilities. And as you can see, we can do that when we recalibrate, we're now, we're now well calibrated, but obviously it changes the predictions. Uh, so one of the questions that, that one has when one is doing this is, do you recalibrate and change the predictions? Uh, in the model. And that's something that um, maybe I'll let Adam say a few words uh, about at the end. Um, <clears throat> then we can also look at the discrimination for any versus none. Uh, again, this is a little bit lower as it was before because it's harder to predict uh, some dehydration compared to severe. Um, and again, a little bit of a drop from the um, validation, from the derivation data, but still pretty good performance. AUCs are close to 0.7. Uh, and again, we can get varied sensitivity and specificity by varying the thresholds here. These thresholds are much higher because you're you're predicting any dehydration rather than rather than severe. Um, and again, the calibration here uh, is not as bad as for the severe de dehydration because the problem uh, really was with the severely dehydrated being underpredicted, not the um, not the, um, the the any dehydration. And again, we can recalibrate that model. Um, and then finally, we can look at the overall performance. So if you recall, the ordinal discrimination on the cross internal cross-validation was 0.76. On the external validation, the average of those two uh, ROCs is 0.715. So we've lost about 4.5% in terms of our AUC area. Um, 
The other thing to, that's interesting is Adam mentioned the WHO algorithm. We compared our model to the WHO algorithm, and you can see it's much, much better. Uh, the confidence intervals don't even overlap. And so we can say that our model is definitely better than the current standard. And um, these are just some, some plots of the sort of the bootstrapped um, ROC areas to show you that basically there's almost no overlap between the uh, the the uh, the red, which is the um, ROC areas in the bootstrap samples for the WHO algorithm, and the green, which is for our model. Um, and that's that's true whether you're talking about severe dehydration, any dehydration, or sort of the overall summary. Um, and then the final point I just want to want to make here is that we actually looked at reliability as well. We had two different nurses measure the same individuals to see whether they could come up with the same uh, result. And looking at the Nerudak models, if we use the the uh, the data from the two nurses, um, we can see that they're very very highly um, uh, correlated. Um, the the reliability is is 0.98. For, for the Nerudak models, whereas for the WHO algorithm, the, the reliability is much less, meaning that it's much harder to reproduce the WHO results um, between two different individuals. So that's, again, another reason why um, we think our model is going to be more useful than the WHO algorithm. Um, and I'm just going to finish by thanking not only um, Adam and Kishin, who have been wonderful people to work with on this project, but our whole team. Um, which is based uh, at Brown, um, which did not only the model development, but all the, um, the app development as well, and, and the clinical team, as well as the team at ICDDRB, which is, in, which is the clinic in, in, in Bangladesh, who collected all the data. Uh, and, and as you see, it was wonderful data. Um, and, and then the app development, which was led by Eric Nelson, uh, who is a colleague um, who has a whole team in India that, that did all the development of the app, which is, which is used. And then, of course, also advanced CTR, which, which has helped um, out uh, throughout with, with um, financing several of us on, on this grant as well. So let me stop there, and hopefully I've left some time for, for questions. So Liz, I don't know if you want to, um, do you want to moderate the questions or do you want me to? Yeah, I can take care of that. Um, yeah, just anyone feel free to put any questions into the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I think this has actually been a really great presentation just to kind of hear about, you know, all the work that you've all been doing, hear more about the data, the process, and particularly the validation aspects. I think hopefully it would be really helpful for those um, who are new to this area and really thinking about all, all the things, especially the validation aspects. And and Adam or Kishin, if you have something you want to say, please go ahead too. Yep, feel free. I mean, I can just maybe ask a more general question. I mean, particularly since I think this series, I think we probably have a mix of attendees, those who maybe are doing machine learning, those who may be new. Um, you know, you you have a lot of experience on the team, maybe just some tips for those who are getting started and really things to think about from your experience, maybe challenges or things um, that you can share with the audience about, particularly if focus on the validation, but maybe other aspects of the study that you could provide. I mean, one thing I would just uh, put as a note of caution to anybody who wants to use machine learning to develop prediction models such as this in medical care is that um, you need a lot of data. And you know the reason that artificial intelligence and machine learning is taking off in the you know area of Silicon Valley is because they have access to you know data on hundreds of millions of people who are providing it freely on a regular basis through their Facebook and Twitter and other mobile apps. But when you actually want to collect this data clinically, uh, especially prospectively, it means that you actually need to enroll thousands of patients in order to have a sufficient number to really develop a stable model. Um, and the problem that so many people get is that they might have you know, a study uh, data set that has 100 people with the outcome of interest, and then they'll put like 50 variables into the model and you just can't do that, that is totally unacceptable. Um, and so if you want to put 50 variables into your model, 
you probably need something more like 5,000 people with the outcome in order to do that, or at least 500 people with the outcome. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, if you do have access to large medical data sets, though, that can be a great way to go about deriving a model. But then as uh, Chris mentioned, you need to have a separate population in which you can validate the model in as well. Yeah, I, know, I noticed, Adam, there's a, there's a question in the chat that's kind of related to that. So um, it says, you know, suppose you have a very imbalanced data set um, where very few people have one outcome. Um, and that's actually very similar to what we had because we did have a very imbalanced data set. And you know, what validation technique do you recommend? And I think, um, you know, any of these techniques would work, but the, the important thing is to make sure that you have enough outcomes um, to be able to develop the model. And that's one of the things we really struggled with, um, you know, what was the sample size we needed? And I don't know if you want to say a few words about kind of how you try to balance the the statistics, but with also with the whole budgetary, you know, implications of, of how long you need to run the study and, and who you need to collect. Yeah. So I'll say for a derivation study, there is a, a simple rule of thumb of saying you need 10 patients with the outcome for every one variable that you are going to enter into your model, not like the final variables in the model, but every one variable that you're going to consider in your model. Um, and then for validation data sets, um, you know, there is sort of also a similar type rule of thumb. There's actually been a couple papers, which happy to share that have um, been published recently that um, have much more um, clearly defined and explicit ways of calculating sample sizes for validation as well as derivation. Um, and um, happy to share those. They're very complicated though. Um, but really, you know, to the person's point, you know, it's not a problem if the outcome is 5% with the disease and 95% without the disease. It just means that you're going to have to enroll a lot of patients to get enough with the disease. But any of these methods that we used uh, will work fine. And, you know, if it is a binary outcome, then you don't even need to use the ordinal methods that we're talking about. You can just use the more simple uh, binary methods. Right. And, you know, I'll, I'll just comment on, you know, these papers that have been published recently and um, again, I don't know, um, we can maybe figure out some way to do this through CTR. Um, maybe we can, we can share some of these links, but these papers oftentimes have, you know, the sample size is, it's not one criteria and there may be several criteria that you need to kind of optimize to get the, to get the sample size right. Um, so, you know, one might be a calibration measure, one might be a discrimination measure, measure. Um, there's there's other things that you might want to optimize for. And so um, there actually are programs written now that you can you can you can sort of run um, to to do that. But that is a fairly new development. Um, you know, and, and so I think that's going to become more and more common. Um, and, and certainly for those of you who might be writing grant proposals or papers uh, where you're going to have to justify your sample size that that may become more more common in the future that you'll have to be very explicit in terms of what you're, you know, you're doing. Um, I think we have a few more questions trickling in. I don't know if the speakers have time to stay on for a bit. Um, one yeah, I can, I can certainly stay on. Um, so let's see, I think there's a question about how large was the validation population in dealing with rare disease. I think we've answered that question. Um, and then the next one is, let's see, uh, the importance of sample sizes. Um, okay, so how you choose the features or variables of interest um, in health data sets that are mostly um, discrete or binary variables. So, you know, how do you choose what features to put into the model? And I'll just say one word and then let let Adam or Kishin comment on that. You know, we developed several different models for this. I just showed you one of them. So. One that we we developed was just the clinical signs and symptoms. Um, another one was combining those with other features of the individuals, for example, their age and their sex. The third one that you might think of, and this might address this whole prevalence issue that we ran across in the validation data where the severe disease was much less, is that there may be external features in the environment that are affecting your outcomes too. So it's not just what somebody presents with, but you could even think about this in a Bayesian context is, you know, 
um, you know that this is a high disease time of year. Uh, you know, cholera is rampant. And so you're just thinking that it's more likely that somebody has severe dehydration because they might have cholera. Um, think about back to COVID, you know, when there's certain times when people are coming to the hospital and you just were more sure they probably had COVID than at other times. So, um, you know, all those are issues that you might want to consider in thinking about all the variables you're looking at. But um, Adam or Kishin, if you have anything to add, please do. Um, nothing to add to that specifically, just for the last person who was asking about sample size, I'll throw some links in the chat to um, uh, some articles you can check out. Perfect. Great. I think, yeah, again, a great presentation. I think we had a lot of great feedback in the chat. Um, and so um, for those who are left, um, yeah, thank you so much to our presenters. Um, and so I think it was mentioned in chat, the, the recording will be posted within next week. Um, and then we'll make sure we, we find a way to share the links um, that are in the chat. Um, thank you for those who were able to attend. And I think at one point um, we posted up the next talk is actually next Friday. Um, I think today we heard a lot about validation, um, use of a supervised machine learning method. The next week we'll hear more about unsupervised machine learning and how that has been used um, um, in, in a study. Um, thank you all so much um, and have a great weekend.